I literally see now that like in that moment, it was just a, a sense of weakness and like a loss of sense of safety and, you know, lacking trust in my physical environment. Hey there, this is Patrice Washington, and you're listening to the Purpose to Platform podcast, where we share stories of women who are using their God-given gifts to chase purpose and create influence, impact, and income with integrity. In today's episode, we're talking about what it takes to push past trauma in order to be pushed in to your God-given purpose. in my own backstory, something that many people didn't know until I started to share within the last few years is that I actually didn't grow up with a lot of confidence and much self-esteem, quite the opposite. I grew up feeling like I had to earn love, to earn approval, uh, just to, I don't even want to say respect um, because as a kid, I don't know how you grew up, but I don't think there was much respect there. Um, I grew up being the ugly one in my family, as told to me by people in my family. And I remember being about six years old, sitting in the tub, letting the water get really, really hot so that I could scrub my skin because I was hoping that the blackness would rub off and that there would be something lighter underneath so that I could look like other members in my family who seemed to be more celebrated. And that would kind of go on. Those types of thoughts and feelings would go on through my entire adolescence where I always found myself tucking my lips in because they were too full or squinting my eyes because I was told they were too big or trying to put extra clothes on because I was too thin. Like everything seemed picked apart my entire childhood. And it only got worse because, of course, there was teasing, which we now say bullying a lot, but there was a lot of teasing back then on top of what I was experiencing at home. And I remember never really talking to anyone about it. It was just something that I that I just dealt with. It was it was definitely always an internal conversation. Never talked to a friend or anyone else about it because I was ashamed I I just, I hated what I looked like. I really tried not to look in the mirror much. And I would be 22 years old before my now husband, Gerald, then he was my boyfriend, would end up learning that this is how I felt about myself. He decorated uh, my apartment with these blown up pictures of me that he loved. And it was supposed to be this great surprise. And I just remember coming in and being a little freaked out by the first one. And I kept walking down the halls of the apartment and seeing more of them and more of them. And while the gesture was very sweet and I, I, I knew it was from a good place, I couldn't help but feel like it was a cruel joke in that moment. And I just remember running outside, sitting on the staircase right outside the door and bawling. So he came out and said, well, what's wrong? I don't understand. What did I do? And I told him, you know, I asked him, why would you do that? Why would you put those pictures up? And he said, because I I think they're beautiful. And that was actually one of the first times that I remember someone referring to me as beautiful. And we went inside and we looked in the mirror. He, He took me to the bathroom to look in the mirror. And he just stood there with me. He's like, I don't know what you see, but I see you as beautiful. And it had never occurred to me that he even thought I was beautiful. We started out as best friends who turned into something. And so he suggested that I go to therapy. And therapy is where I learned that really what I heard from people in my family and others were really their own insecurities. Um, And really it was meant to be a distraction. I think in a spiritual way, I learned later that those things were meant to distract me from destiny because I had a call on my life as we all do. We're all born with something that we're supposed to do in this world to be a blessing to others. But if you can be distracted early on and feel that you're not uh, worthy of those opportunities or no one should see you or you should you know, be seen and not heard or any of these things that keep a lot of us back, then that's what happens. It keeps a lot of us back. 
And so going to therapy is where I learned to forgive people who will never say I'm sorry and where I learned that hurt people hurt people. So how do I use this experience, this trauma, this pain to be a blessing to others? Yes, but also to be a blessing to myself. Like how can I take something that was supposed to possibly hold me back, right? And use it as a way to actually propel me into purpose, into my destiny, into my calling. All right, Whitney. I was actually on two podcasts. No, I was on one podcast and I did an interview this week. So your girl was doing her thing and I'm just happy. Um, It was good though, because I usually don't tell my story. Like, I don't like telling people that I was once suicidal and had postpartum depression because, like, that's, like, a really, really dark point in my life. But I feel like that's where most of my transformation happened. Like, that's where the most of the mother came out of me. And so it was good to just share it and no longer, like, hide behind that or what I did or how I got to that point. Like, I don't know. I just felt like chains were broken off of me. And then I started thinking about some of the things from my childhood that led up to that moment. And it got me to a point where I feel like there's conversations that I need to have with my own mother to get some things off my chest that I've kind of been like holding on to for a long time. But I think that that's important too. So this just helps me to enrich my program because a lot of times we don't realize how childhood experiences have shaped us into the mothers we are today and the situations that we encounter and how we respond to our kids. Like all of that has a lot to do with our childhood experiences. And so then when I had that aha moment, I was like, ooh, that's good. So now I know how to go even deeper into my method and really start to touch people in a different way it's like almost like everything was like handcrafted like I was supposed to go through it the way that I went through it so that now when I get ready to share it it's it's lit like I don't know I don't even know how to explain it I just feel way more comfortable in who I am and that's it I really don't think that any of us can truly walk in our purpose live in our purpose unless we deal with our childhood trauma, unless we deal with our grief, unless we deal with the trials and tribulations of our past. Many times I find in my work that people have all the skill and education and intelligence to do that thing that they are called to do. The thing that holds them back is not embracing their story not embracing whatever pain came from their past and seeing it as a conduit to their calling as opposed to a blocking, like a block to their calling. So they'll see it as the reason why they can't or why they shouldn't do something. And I really believe that even when I look at my own life, many of the hardest times in my life, many of the most difficult times, my cry on the bathroom floor moments, while they brought me the greatest amount of grief, they also brought me an opportunity to really dig deeper, ask myself more questions, and really get to what am I really here to do? All right, Evelyn and then Krista. All right, I'm going to try to keep it quick, but I have three things quickly. So I had a massive breakthrough on... uh, Lacey's call this week. So Lacey had said to us, you know, so many of the things that you deal with now have been imprinted in your mind since before you were seven years old. And she had us literally stop and think, what was the first time you ever felt a trauma? And I swear to God, I did not remember this, but I vividly remembered now being horribly bullied. I was like five years old. Um, I was in kindergarten and there was a girl in fifth grade and it sounds silly now when I talk about it, but like at that time I was terrified. She would like just shove me around. And at one point I remember her holding my throat and holding me against a wall. Um, and of course at five years old, you don't know how to verbalize that. So it was always just, I have a bellyache. I don't want to go to school. That's what I told my parents. Um, but anyway, uh, w- once it was resolved, I, I literally see now that like in that moment, it was just a, 
a sense of weakness and like a loss of sense of safety and, you know, lacking trust in my physical environment. And so then, of course, Miss Lacey has us talk about more traumas or write down more traumas that we've gone through. And every single one that I wrote down from that time until now were centered around feeling weak and feeling unsafe and feeling like I didn't trust my environment. And now I realize why, you know, I got into martial arts and everything and um, I'm avid about women's self-defense for myself and even my daughters. Now I know why. Um, and now I also know why I am so triggered when people question like my, my strength or my ability because it's like, damn it, I work so hard to not be that weak individual and you're bringing it back. So huge, huge breakthroughs. And, and now I have some more work to do because I really never made that connection ever before in my life. I remember one of the first times that I remember being bullied in a way that it just, it hit me in my core. I was in middle school and back then we used to three-way call. And now we were three-way calling all of our friends and, you know, getting connected. And there were a couple girls, but a lot of boys. And I remember one boy in particular, I know his name to this day, but I shall not say. <laughs> I remember the question being posed, when you think of, insert girl's name, what movie do, what, what movie do you think of? And I remember somebody was like, Pretty Woman. And there was a couple other titles. And when it got to me, I'm not sure that they even knew I was still on because I thought I was going to have to hang up, but I didn't want to mess up the train. And so I stayed on and they said, Mighty Ducks. And I was devastated because again, since the age of about six, I had already been hearing all of these um, negative words, you know, negative talk about what I look like. And I cried that night. Like I cried real tears because it just confirmed what I had already heard and what I already believed about myself. And for years after that, I would hide out and I would definitely rarely get on those multiple three-way call type of type of things and the interesting thing is I saw that gentleman a couple years ago I was speaking somewhere and he came up to me after I was speaking and I was signing books and taking pictures with people and he and his wife came up and he's like man I'm so proud of you and and all these things and I actually had told the story about going to therapy, growing up feeling ugly. And he was like, I can't believe you felt that way. And I wanted to, <laughs> I just, it wasn't the environment to say, you did that. You were a part of that. People like you caused so much pain for so many years. And it dawned on me, you know, 15 years later, he has no memory of the fact that he was one of the people who bullied me because there were other things that he said throughout the course of middle school. And it was the reminder that hurt people hurt people. And whenever we are be being bullied, what I've learned since then is to have compassion for people who stoop to those levels because it says so much more about them than it does about us. And so I've learned to pray for my enemies but also people who don't consider themselves to be enemies. They're just unfortunately hurt people not knowing how to move through their own process on their own journey. And so they just leave casualties along the way. But I've made a decision that I won't block my purpose because I'm allowing myself to be a casualty of somebody else's issues. Dion, do you have your hand up for a win? You came in there quick. Let's go. Let's start with the win. Less than an hour ago, I got a message from SBA Small Business Association, the community that I work with in South Carolina, and they want me to sit on a panel. <laughs> okay. 
So that's the part I'm happy about, and I'm grateful for it. Two seconds after that, all of my anxiety about the way I look and my presentation just overwhelms me. So I know I'm going to do it. I got to get over this image of me. Do you realize how much progress you've made in the last few months? Like I've known Dion for, for longer than everybody else. Dion would not turn a camera on. <laughs> she wouldn't turn the camera on. The fact that you come on here, you get on camera. Then she was like, oh, I don't do videos. The fact that you have done a couple videos now. Because you kicked my butt. But all of this, like I, I, I'm saying that to say that you're in a season of radical healing. I really do believe that. Like you're in a season where God is going to keep calling you out and pulling this out of you. He's doing it while you have community. So you'll have the consistent support and the prayers that you solicited, but also all of these little exercises, even just turning your camera on every week, like all of that are just seeds because there are more things coming. And, and so you're in preparation phase. And when you're not here in the group, when you're not, um, in therapy, back to the journaling and the getting in the mirror, you got to keep, you know, participating in your own rescue because that way you can move, the, move this process along a little bit, you know, but I just want to acknowledge the fact that you've done tremendous work and you should be so proud of it. And I'm so proud of you. So just thank you for being here and knowing that this is a space where you can share. There's no judgment from not a soul on this call. We love you. We support you. And we're proud of you. Thank you, ladies. has allowed me to see that this is a real thing. It's a real deterrent to women being able to pursue their purpose, to anyone being able to pursue their purpose. And so when I see that in the women in my communities, oftentimes I'll remind them that our business is only going to grow to the extent that we're willing to heal. You know, it only takes one person to come in. For me, it took three years of therapy, but I've seen so many people who have had literal angels walk into their lives and remind them of who they are, remind them of their greatness, remind them of what's possible for their lives. And for some of us, maybe it's a teacher. For some of us, you know, it could be someone at your church. It could be a neighbor. It literally can be anybody. I think that when we're ready, though, is when that person can really show up. Because in my own life, once I really got still and looked back, the truth is, well before I started therapy, there were people who told me, that I was beautiful, that I was capable, that I was destined for greatness all throughout my life, I could not hear them. I couldn't believe what they were saying. I couldn't receive it. And so I think that there's definitely a time, especially if we're searching or yearning for it, that someone will appear and just give us that, that one word or that one message that can shift everything but it also has to collide with or coincide with when we're ready to believe the truth and stop feeding into the lies.
This is Patrice Washington, and thank you so much for listening to the Purpose to Platform podcast. If you resonate at all with this episode, please subscribe to the show via Apple Podcasts and rate and review. The ladies and I have enjoyed our time with you this week, and we invite you to join us next week for a brand new story. Take care.